Well, uh, as anybody who's in wine probably knows, the wine industry is global and huge. We all love talking to each other, but because it's so big, there's not that many topics that we can all agree on. You know, you, we, you're not going to get people in California talking about, you know, what's just happened in Tuscany. So we all gossip about very narrow range of things, which are usually how much sulfur you should put in wine and what wine writers up to. And so anybody puts up a post about wine writers, it goes off, everybody talks about it. And I've been reading, I always read this, and I'd read a few in quick succession where people, some quite serious people, were suggesting that the problem with wine writing was that it wasn't doing enough to promote wine. It was specifically not doing anything to sell wine, that wine writing should be a sales tool. Now, that, that really raised my hackles for a couple of reasons. One is ever since social media we've and, and other things, we're, we're now living in a, a culture that isn't drenched this promotion. Uh, we've become a world where people are very conscious that somebody might take a picture of them and put them on Facebook at any time. And wine is supposed to be about authenticity. And I think the worst thing that we could do is to buy into that culture of sell, 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 that everything is about selling rather than about conversation and talking. Secondly, there's also the contract between the writer and the reader. And the writer has to be uh, has to be upfront and honest about what they're doing. Now, I used to work in advertising as a copywriter. It was my job to sell through print, and I can sell ice to Eskimos, and I've got the results to prove it. But when you try and sell something to somebody, you're very clear that that's the transaction that's happening, usually because it's marked out as marketing. You know, I've got something to sell. I want you to buy it. Are you interested? And it's very transparent, very honest. If you're a writer for a newspaper or a blog or whatever and you've got that I want to sell you but you're not being clear and honest about that transaction, then you're actually tricking the reader. It's a dishonest thing to do. Um, and lastly, I think it's a complete misunderstanding of the role of what a critic is. A critic is somebody who is there to advise advance the conversation and to get people talking and get people thinking and communicating passion and enthusiasm and excitement is part of that. But turning that role into a specific sales role bothered me a great deal and the fact that people in wine were saying it's just all about selling, I think it's problematic on many levels. So I wrote that and I named the articles that I was uh, I was criticising and one of them was by Dr Damien Wilson who teaches marketing at Sonoma University and Damien and I get on great. So he immediately came back and said, well, I want to write a response to this. And he did. He wrote a very thoughtful response, which is on the website, where he said, well, you know, if, if anybody's involved in wine, then it's important that we all do the heavy lifting and, um, and, you know, it's up to all of us to sort of try and encourage people to drink wine. And I do see his point. I understand his point, but I'm, I'm sticking to mine, which is the role of the writer is not the role of a copywriter, which is a different thing. As to your question about is it better to be on staff or independent to do certain types of stories, well, that's a wriggly can of worms. Um, if you're talking about investigative stories, the chances of you selling it to most wine magazines are pretty low. Most consumer wine magazines wouldn't take it. You'd be looking at a trade magazine. Um, depends on the type of story. Our a uh, colleague publication, Wein Wirtschaft at Mining Flag, the publisher I work for in Germany, does very exceptional, outstanding investigative work. They've really broken some big stories, particularly about fraud, um, and they've gone to court over it and they've spent a lot of money, they've tracked um, court documents, They've done, and, and sometimes doing a really big investigative story like they've done can take a very, very long time. So for that you need resources and the, the resource that you particularly need is you need a publisher who's got a lawyer who can advise you on when you're crossing the line or not and also somebody that um, has got your back when you get taken to court as you will be taken to court. Um, being taken to court is not a problem as long as you've you've fulfilled all, all the um all the duties. So if you try and do that as a as a freelancer, as an outsider, you are opening yourself up to uh, all sorts of problems. However, the thing is, if you are an outsider, it can be a lot easier for you to uh, go and go and do the the shoe leather work and and go and uh, you know if you're in, excited and interested enough in the story to to spend the time. Which if you're working on a publication, they probably won't give you the time to go and do it. So it's six of one, half a dozen of the other is my answer. Digital wine. I think we've seen some very exciting stuff in the last couple of years, particularly uh, Wine Folly. I know she gets criticised a lot for her 
you know, some of her wine knowledge. But she has grasped the opportunity, which digital really is, which is about being visual and about visualising data. And uh, I think there's lots of scope for that, which I'd like to see. Um, I think one thing that, that we haven't seen in digital wine is, is this visualisation of data, which is what the internet does really well. Uh, of course, it's expensive to do. It's very time consuming. But I would love somebody to come along and do something like show a map of where vineyards are moving into cooler climate areas and retreating from warmer climate areas. I think digital allows you to do those things in a way that nothing else does. Um, as far as writing goes, I must say I am seeing I'm seeing much less that is innovative, actually. I feel like we're going round and round the same topics a fair bit. And uh, sometimes sometimes I think it can even get quite trivial. Um, but the immediacy of it is absolutely wonderful. The fact that you can uh, you can spy on somebody's tasting as they're doing it in some exotic corner of the world and that you really do get a sense of what's happening in real time, which social media gets you, I think is very, very exciting. Uh, so it's... Uh, it's been, I think it's been good for the wine trade in lots of ways, but I think there's a lot of opportunity that's still to be explored. Um, okay, so you want to be a wine communicator. Well, it's not as hard as people think. What you need is you need a different point of view. You need a strong point of view and you need to be able to communicate it effectively. So how do you communicate it effectively? Well, you need the communication tools. So whether you're a text-based person or you're a photography or you're a visual or you're a graphic designer, as as many skills as you can acquire in that field um, will boost you above a lot of people. The, the problem with uh, communication of all kinds, and it's not just the wine media, is like every other area of society, it's very quickly polarising into a few people at the top and a lot of people at the bottom. And if you want to stay out of that bottom heap, uh, don't do the same things that everybody else is doing. So what would that be, for example? A lot of people write what I think of as what I did on my holiday essays. They'll go to a region and they'll tell you I did this and I did that and I love this and I love that. Everybody, the world is awash with people writing that kind of material. Uh, if you write it, you'll just go to the pile with everybody else. Uh, but if you look at people who have come out of nowhere and they have really shot to the top, there are people like um, Simon Wolfe is a really good example. He's somebody who's got a point of view about things. and. You don't always necessarily agree with his point of view, but he, he has an idea about what he stands for and he puts it very clearly and he's not afraid to put it and he backs it up uh, and that makes him, you know, successful. So that's what I'd say. Get your skills together. And, and, and I'm not talking about wine tasting skills. Um, they're almost less important than everything else because you can take people on the journey as you learn about wine. You don't have to know all of that already, uh, but you do have to have those those rock solid skills. That's my That's my opinion. I think some very dramatic changes are coming up in the wine world. One that I'm really surprised that people haven't paid more attention to is the demographic changes that are happening internationally. If you look at the UK, you look at the United States, you look at uh, Western Europe and you look at countries like Australia, you're seeing um, the biggest transfer of wealth in history happening right now as baby boomers begin to retire. Now, a lot of people who are stalwarts in the wine industry internationally are in the baby boomer generation and they're about to exit the wine industry. So who is it that's going to take over their roles as wine writers, wine buyers, all of those people. They are the most educated and international group in history. If you look at young Europeans today, they can speak three languages, they all typically have master's degree, they've all done internships overseas. We have never seen people like this before. So I actually think that the wine industry is, is going to, in the next decade, see a, a real dynamism of, of the life that we haven't seen before because a lot of the, the traditional strictures that have held back some of the old world countries will probably be blown away by this new generation. At the same time, I think it's going to be harder and harder to make money. Um, the baby boomers and the, the greatest generation before them had nice, comfy pensions and, and they're actually spending quite a lot on wine. Uh, the generations behind them not only are not capable of spending that much money on wine, uh, they're actually drinking less alcohol than their uh, their predecessors did, so there's that. The In terms of who 
really controls what wine you'll have in front of it. I, I think the future will look like the past. It will be the distributors and the sales chain. Um, wine critics uh, really don't have that much um, sway in a sense. It, you, it, they, they can only write about wines that are available. And the big buyers, people like the buyers at Costco in the United States, the buyers of the LCBO in Canada, of System Malagat in Sweden, of the big supermarket chains in Europe and the UK, they're the ones that really determine uh, what the trends are and what's put in front of um, uh, what's put in front of consumers. So I think the future in that sense is going to look a lot like the past. Well, the, the easy answer, of course, is that we should all be consuming wine moderately and, and not drinking too much. There is a form of moderation that I would like to see in the wine trade, and I've given this a lot of thought and thought about would, would I say this publicly or not, and I'm, I'm going to do it. I really wish wine writers and the wine trade in general would tamp down the conversation about wine and health. Uh, I've heard the most ludicrous claims being thrown about about how healthy wine is. I've seen lots of people who want to promote wine because of its health benefits. Uh, you know, some British tabloid will, will run some, you know, completely scientifically unfounded story on how red wine can cure Alzheimer's or dementia and suddenly I see it all over the wine press with no, no critical underpinnings to the articles at all and this is really dangerous. The governments of the world are quite rightly looking at ways to crack down on alcohol because alcohol is a huge problem and uh, by being ridiculous about the way that we talk about wine and health, we're just handing them a tool with which to beat us one day uh, because all you need is you need somebody who really knows what they're talking about to say, look at all this nonsense that the wine trade, um, uh, you know, produces for it to be a real problem. The, the issue is that wine and health is not clear. The link between them is not clear. It's very clear that there is... Uh, you know, at a certain level, it has cardiovascular benefits, but some of the other implications of wine have not been teased out, and it's just it's just dangerous for people in wine to be making scientific and health claims uh, about an area that's incredibly contentious. So I think that's that's what I would really like to see moderation on to talk about wine as what it is, which is it's a, a fantastic social lubricant. It's a fantastic part of our cultural life it's something that goes wonderfully well with food we don't have to add on top of it that it's got some sort of magical properties which maybe we won't be able to uh, 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 you know stand by later on well there are uh, multiple people who control what we drink. Uh, we all like to think that our choices are made by us, but actually a lot of choices have been made before we even begin to think about what we might like to have with, with dinner. Government obviously is a major player around the world and uh, they either hate alcohol because they see it as socially destructive, as in Russia, or they love alcohol because they see it as a fantastic way to, to raise tax revenues. Uh, so that's that's absolutely number one. The government's view on wine uh, will have a lot to do with what you end up drinking. Secondly, the big retailers, the supermarkets, the LCBOs, the system belagets, they also have an enormous impact. I don't think consumers realise how much wine education they get in those mature markets. If you walk into system belaget or you walk even into um, Marks and Expenses. The amount of thinking that's gone into the retail layout and the way that the bottles are put and the way that they're promoted, you can actually walk around the aisles and come out and you've, you've had quite a wine education without realising it. And so if Marks and Spencer's decides to take on a, a country like Georgia, they can they can launch it, you know, and, and all the, uh, the hipsters will be thinking that they discovered it for themselves, but they didn't. It was because somebody big, you know, said bring it into the country that encourage other people and, and so on. Um, at a top end, it's still true that you can build a brand in the on-trade with sommeliers. That's still very true. Um, but in some markets now, social media is absolutely the most important thing. In China particularly, uh, what is happening, the way consumers communicate to one another is, is you know, absolutely probably more important than anything else. So uh, I would just say in the end that some of the changes that we're going to see in the world of wine in the next few years are actually being driven by the large retailers. System Belaget in Sweden, for example, has made a big commitment to sustainability and they're such a big retailer that everybody in the world who wants to be in Sweden is rushing to make their vineyards organic or biodynamic or whatever. So uh, even those of us who live outside of Sweden are being very affected by what happens, uh, the decisions being made by those big buyers.
If you were a tremendously skilled digital person, if you were somebody that could take vast reams of data and you could turn it into an interesting visual or a dynamic visual, you would clean up, you could make a mozza. Uh, uh, there would be lots of people who would be keen to use your services. Of course, if you had those skills, you probably wouldn't want to be working in wine. You'd probably want to go and work for somebody who could pay you a lot more money. The, uh, I think there's a real mismatch between the skills that the wine industry needs and what everybody wants to do. Everybody wants to be a wine critic in a day that, you know, the, the days of being a wine critic are really over. So if you've got really good technical skills and you want to be in wine, I think there's a lot of, a lot of doors that would open up for you. Uh, in other ways, if you want to be a traditional critical celebrity type person, then you're going to need a book or you're going to need a television show. Uh, you know, maybe you can leverage your your website into something that will give you the credibility to land one of those things. But yeah, like, like I said earlier, you know, wine, like everything else, like the arts, like fashion, like like everything, is 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 turning into a superstar economy. I mean, where there are people at the top and there's everybody else. And if you're serious about this game, you should be thinking, how can I, how can I get myself to the top? And that is things like writing books and, uh, and all of that. Excellent. Well, I have this, my new podcaster. I'm going to teach myself podcasting if I can uh, I did some radio a long time ago and I'd like to go back and do, do some of that and uh, of course I'm busy working on my own projects and busy working on my own skills uh, I, I really I really do believe that the secret to success in this game is or, or getting anywhere is actually having a really really good skill base you don't need qualifications you don't um, you don't need to go to university and learn how to be a wine writer but you've got to be technically good at what you do so Podcasting or bust, basically. <laughs>